You're listening to iCannabisRadio.com. Hi, welcome, welcome. You're listening to iCannabis Radio. I'm Georgia. Today is the 8th of October, um, 2012, and... I just moved the microphone hi, out of the way. It was cutting off the middle of my face. Not that you guys probably minded that much. So what an interesting day we've had. What an interesting week we have had. <laughs> I'm here in the studio with my ever-crazy producer, Chris Rosales. What up? How's it going? How's it? <laughs> He's just going through puberty. And so sometimes he has that thing that happens to boys' voices. <laughs> my mic wasn't on, so I didn't hear that. <laughs> It was a loogie, by the way. Oh, that sounds pretty. And then, of course, intern Sam, what's up? Hello. So Sam and Jason and uh, Meg and Jenny Cush and the guys from Top Shelf Extract, IDAB Radio, and I all attended the Hemp Connoisseur Championship Award Ceremony on Friday night at Castleman's. And it was really fun. I am not a social person. Um, I am very... Um, Set in my ways, you know, Friday night I spend with my family, that kind of thing. And so I was like, oh, I have to get out of my routine and go spend some time with friends, which was wonderful. Um, But what was even more wonderful about that was the the winners. And we're going to have – we did interviews with the winners and we're going to have – we're going to have – broadcast on a Thursday afternoon right after the Hemp Connoisseur show of interviews with the winners and kind of some uh, play of what was happening that night. But what was really cool about this event, um, and I love when when patient judges get to judge um, their their own medicine and they get to make determinations about what they like the best. Um, so there was, there was a big cadre of, of patients, um, primarily in the metro area, um, and then there was the connoisseur choice as well, which were the, the expert judges, which is whatever. They were just patients who happened to work in the industry, I would guess. Um, but but uh, pretty wonderful. Um, and and I'm excited that some of the winners were, were I mean, it ranged from kind of small single store um, MMCs to, to some of the, of the big guys. And that was pretty cool. Um, you know, the, the growing kitchen, um, won first place edible for their fantastic brownie. It also won best overall product, which is a pretty humongous win. So congratulations to the growing kitchen. Um, in addition, um, you know, we had just a whole range of winners and their, their categories were, um, obviously indica and sativa and hybrid. And there was a CBD, um, both flower and, and edible category, um, I mean, it was just big fun, and there were bands. Um, of course, there was a um, concentrates category because what would a medical marijuana event be without talking about concentrates? Um, and you know, our lovely friends at Top Shelf Extracts won won third overall and first tied for first in the Connoisseur's Choice. Awesome, and awesome! It, it's so awesome, um, and you know, it's it's cute. They they've won a lot of stuff now. They're big winners. And uh, so, so when they win, um, you know, they, I think they kind of expect to win. I think, I think anytime you win some stuff, you expect to win, but they still get giddy and giggly. It's really pretty cute. So, so tune in Thursday at, at uh, five o'clock and we're going to run this really fun um, hour long special of uh, the winners for the Hemp Connoisseur Championship. And this is the first time they've done this. They're going to do it um, Hopefully annually. Here's their little winners cards, um, and so keep a lookout for it. And I think the next Hemp Connoisseur uh, magazine comes out in um, December. I think what month is this? October? Yeah, probably. Yeah, we're December. in October. We're in October. <laughs> yeah, didn't I say it was the eighth? Yeah. Yeah. Did I tell you guys? I think I did. That my dad turned 79 years old last week. Awesome. Yeah, 79, and he's maybe one of the funniest people I know. He's really funny. Um, and when my dad laughs, he um, he like belly laughs. He's a tall guy. He's he's a thin tall guy, and so you don't really expect to have a full on ho 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 Santa laugh come out of him. But oh man, he just he makes me he makes me giggle. He's he's one of my favorite people to hang out with. So um, happy birthday to my dad! And oh my gosh, my sister in law, um, my brother Rob's wife has a birthday this week. October is just what is with all these Virgos? They're or Libras, Libras. 
I just my, it's everywhere. My, my little uh, cousin's birthday today too. Oh, and She's didn't you 15 go? Fifteen years old, and yeah, and my niece's my fiance's niece, uh, quinceanera was on Saturday. Help me say that right. Quince. 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 Nera. Nera. There you go. Taco. No, burrito. <laughs> <laughs> I I think having a big fifteenth birthday party would be amazing. It was beautiful. It was it was really beautiful. What'd she wear? She had this white dress with silver. I, I didn't take any pictures on my phone. What? I feel bad. I I don't know. I don't know why. But there's plenty of pictures. I'll bring some in so you can check her out. But she looked very beautiful. Her the white dress is traditional, right? Pretty much, yes. Yeah. Yes, and uh, she had like a silver lining, and she was wearing some some uh converse that went up to her knees <laughs> and that's then, awesome and then one of the the traditions is they do a dance and they do exchanging of like the shoes where she's allowed to wear high heels now because she's a woman oh so the dad puts on her high heels for i'm her. gonna cry that's yeah, awesome it was, it was pretty nice it was it was it was good it was it was awesome i that's, had I had, a, I had a great time that sounds beautiful well happy birthday to amy's niece that's wonderful nisa is her name Quinceanera. Yeah, quinceanera. Quinceanera. Fun yeah. times. I think I'm going to have one because I didn't get to have one. <laughs> they don't have them for boys, though, but they have them for girls. Duh. <laughs> so we got some um, some news that I want to talk about. I mean, some of it, like, I am so just chomping at the bit to talk about some stuff. And others, uh, but I sort of want to wait until um, after our first guest. I'm really excited. You know, I have said for a couple times now that we're going to have Chris Stubbs from can labs come and talk to us about testing we've had we've had can labs in before um but it's been quite a while and they have um i mean it it feels like every time we talk to them there is a new process or something new that they're looking for something new that that um, centers are asking for Uh, so it's always nice to get uh, uh, the new perspective of what's going on in the world of testing it's just you know i think about did you guys think that that five or ten years ago um you know there would be companies that were set up just to test the different cannabinoids available in in marijuana i mean that's so amazing that is it's awesome i think it's it's, I, I wish more dispensaries did it and were not afraid to do it and think that something bad was going to happen because, you know, a lot of dispensaries have the same strain. Yep. And, you know, it's it. I think it's worth it for them to, I'm not exactly sure what the price is, but I think it's worth it for them. Well, you know, and we'll talk to Chris a little bit about this. I think some of the reluctance, I mean, you're right. Um, there's a, there's a, there's two things I think going on. I think one is the fear of, oh my gosh, what if I test my product and it turns out to be really low? Um, or B, um, that they've heard that testing isn't accurate. If you go to one lab, one batch has tested at X percent and you take that same batch to another lab and it tests, tests at a different percentage and why is that? So maybe we'll have Chris kind of help us through that. Um, and so because of that, um, I think people have have... Some some centers have put testing on the back burner because they felt like it maybe hasn't been worth their money. Um, but you know, edible companies um, typically test all of their um, all of their bases every single time to make sure that their edibles are um, are consistent. Which which kind of brings me to my first news story. Of course, I say that, and it was. Uh, that story is at the bottom of my stack. But, you know, there was an interesting <laughs> <laughs> article um, out of the Seattle Times. Um, Medical marijuana, medibles industry thrives, lacks safety regulations. Um, the talk about how um, edibles have been, um, and, and they are, of course, in, in Colorado too, one of the fastest growing portions of the industry. And, and the fact that, um, you know, gone are the days where your choices are um, a brownie that someone made from leaf material um, to possibly, you know, if you're lucky, you get an oatmeal raisin cookie, but that also is made with leaf material and it's green and it has an odor. And I mean, those days are so gone. Um, but the article in in um, the Seattle Times talks about how, you know, the industry is thriving, but there's very little regulation. Um, and um, this this poor edibles owner um 
this is the start of the article. The kitchen in the weather-beaten beachfront cabin near Olympia is cramped and freckled with mysterious brown stains. A shaggy dog named Butter, that's with T's, not D's, <laughs> is poking around, and a quarter-sized spider dangles at the window. It's not the best si- situation, Jim Chancy acknowledges, for a home-based business making marijuana-infused products called, quote-unquote, medibles. We don't really call them that here. Um, but in Washington's scantily regulated medical marijuana industry, no one is checking how such food and drink products are made or how safe they are. And there's a lot to check. And it goes on to talk about how, you know, this wide range of, of products is being, is being made, including taco mix. Have you guys heard about, about really? Is, uh, that's, that's a new one to me. That sounds really gross. But Chris is here, so, so welcome. Hi, hi. Jump Thank right you. in. Yeah, the uh, taco mix. Yeah, I've seen and engineered a lot of strange things myself. I bet you have. That's part of what we'll talk about a little yeah, bit. Taco it's, mix. It's all about um, formulations and knowing the dose and, and getting it into a form that works well. And so, yeah, it, you can ingest it in many, many ways. You can, can you? It helps a lot, I think, for a lot of people. Well, it really does. And, and that's part of what I think this article is, is after is mm-hmm. the fact that this is a wonderful way to medicate. Yeah. Um, but... But it's an unintended consequence of the growth of the industry. Um, we, on the other hand, I printed out the regulations in Colorado, um, just the cleanliness regulations. Not these; these are just the oh, state regulations. Yeah. These aren't even these aren't even the mu- municipal regulations, which right. talk about needing a commercial kitchen and having to meet commercial kitchen standards. I mean, the idea of in in Washington State, it's okay to do this all in your home kitchen right. um, with your dog butter. Um, in Colorado, you can't do that. In Denver, specifically, there's a lot of things you can't do. But but look at this. These are these are three full pages of of regulations about cleanliness, and they include things. And I kid you not, um, you can't go to work if you have an open sore or a boil. Mm-hmm. Specifically names that. <laughs> um, which you know what? I mean, I love having regula- regulation that says I can send my employees home if they have a boil because I never would have thought to do that myself. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, some of it's overkill, and it it's a perfect crossroads of. Uh, state and local statute and regulatory authority and um, all kinds of things that sometimes end up reaching in a little too far. I mean, they started with our uh, regular sanitary requirements right. and then built into that based on horror stories and people's fears. And so you see in all of our uh, state statutes that regulate the industry you see some of that sure it's all it's all based on the lowest common denominator. What is the yeah. worst possible thing that someone has? Seen Not, or yeah, thir- thought of, of or heard of, is, yeah. exactly, um, and and um, you know we again we were we're going to talk a little bit about about testing and dosing dosages and those kinds of things when uh, after our next break, Chris, when, when we okay. grill you for all the information that you can possibly give us in thirteen minutes, <laughs> um, deal, deal. Um, but you know they have this whole definition of what sanitation is and. Um, and <laughs> sorry, so so to any person, uh, you have to you, you have to have precautions to ensure the following: that any person who, by medical examination or supervisory observation, is shown to have or appears to have an illness, an open lesion, including s- boils, sores, or infected wounds, or any other abnormal source of microbial contamination, for whom there is a reasonable possibility of contact with pr- pr- preparation surfaces, for medical there, yeah, for medical. The- right there is like yes. if they may be able to touch it i mean right and that's the same thing if you went to a uh sandwich truck or out to eat like you want this you want that yes. and i you know we've wanted forever to be safe with edibles even though you know you, it is incredibly safe in, in a million different ways that's right but um when it's in the government's hands you obviously have to have that additional it does, requirement and it's yeah it's wild it does take it does take a, a, a different turn mm-hmm. um, but it's just interesting that that Washington is so different that they haven't yet mm-hmm. kind of put regulations around around something that you know it's it's bad enough something that you're going to ingest by smoking but something that you're going to eat um, that someone has prepared is I mean that's just yeah ew so mm-hmm. they they give some um, some examples of things that needs need to kind of happen there's no state rules. So while in 1998, Washington became one of the first states to legalize medical marijuana long before the emergence of storefront dispensaries or medibles, since they arrived, the law hasn't been kept up. In 2011, um, a bill passed by the legislator would have regulated medibles, uh, requiring, requiring licensing, kitchen inspections, independent quality testing, those kinds of things. The governor voted for most of it, saying inspections 
open state employees to federal jeopardy, which is kind of the opposite of what's happened here. Um, Colorado has stepped in and said, you know what, we're, we're, we, we want to regulate, therefore we have to enforce those regulations, therefore we have to have state employees who do that. Um, Washington has said, wow, we want all of those things, but we're not willing to put our state employees in jeopardy. Right. So it's so it's just a little bit um, of a different perspective. Yeah. Um, again, everything goes back to the fact that, that surprise, surprise, metal, marijuana continues to be a Schedule One drug. Um, let's deschedule it soon. Um, mm-hmm. Let's see what else. Um, you know, they want to do some some quality controls, and that's kind of where uh, where testing comes in. And yeah. and you know, again, we remember the days where someone would eat a cookie and one half of the cookie they're like i don't feel anything and then the next day they ate the second half of the cookie and surprise surprise that whole dose. <laughs> yeah. it was the whole dose and they slept for two and a half days yeah there's a lot to that a lot to formulations absolutely yeah. absolutely so so while regulation people get annoyed with regulation and it feels burdensome and those kinds of things i mean you know you, getting a perspective of a state that doesn't have that same kind of regulation and it's nice to know that you can go to a medical marijuana center in colorado and you can purchase an item by um uh, by a, a manufacturer and purchase that same item in another town and you're going to have the same reaction, the same response, you're going to have the same dosage. It's going to be, it's going to look the part, same. Yeah. yeah. As long as they're testing and doing their due diligence. That's right. There's still, there's a, always a percent error um, that comes out of the lab and there's always uh, sampling error and, and cooking error, you know, the manufacturing process itself. And that goes for all industries. Right. What's That's funny right. about this is it's, you know, we look at it um, like humans do a lot of things is the most important. This has never been done, but in other areas of industry and other medical plants specifically and other formulations with medical plants, um, you have to spot test, you have to right. formulate and homogenize everything properly to make sure that all the cookies got it, not just part. That's right. Um, and a lot of the other times, you know, in these other industry examples, there's a big money behind it. <clears throat> that are willing to do the R and D in house right. and from third party sources to confirm their data, and you end up with a product like, you know, McDonald's coffee, for example. It's the same at any McDonald's That's you right. go to always, and their coffee's tested more than our medical cannabis is. Right. Um, so there's a l- we have a long way to go, but. It's getting there. And Colorado is a banner example. I think that's why um, Prop 19 failed. You know, they had no way of regulation. And now we've got right. 64 coming up. And that's really interesting to me to see the numbers are the same polling. And you know what I mean? Given right. their percent errors, like leading into this. Yep. And if it's that much, much of a toss up, I feel like we might have somewhat of an edge because we have some regulatory structure in place. And that's not to say that it's given them being the state and or the feds reasons to nitpick and not uh, show fully what your charges are and what right. you can do to rectify that right. to stay in business, etc. There's been a lot of cases of people getting shorthanded on that. But um, regardless of if, if that's the case or not, at least we have it. And I, th- <clears throat> I don't know. I saw that whole process and was very frustrated in a number of ways. But we got some rules on the books that make sense and the industry is moving forward. So, I agree. I know, couldn't agree more. Do? And yeah. we're going to talk about your component of it in just yeah. a minute. We're going to take a quick break. Um, and then we'll come back and we'll talk to uh, more to Chris Stubbs of Can Labs. Noto, your urban source for all of your gardening needs. Noto Urban Garden Supply, located at 1330 27th Street in Denver, Colorado, between <laughs> Larimer and Walnut on 27th. You're always trying to catch me getting one of those numbers wrong, aren't you? Yep, you're always waiting for me to get it wrong, but I won't. I won't. Go visit Levi at Noto Urban Garden Supply. He can answer all of your grow questions, whether you are a uh, big grower or you are just a hobby cultivationist you're a small guy Noto can help you out and Levi definitely knows how to answer all of those questions we're moving from the summer into the fall and winter season and you know that takes some toll on your plants and so go check them out n-o-d-o urbangardensupply.com Noto Urban Garden Supply 
go get the compost tea for free. I know it has saved my big ficus tree in my house. I can tell you that much. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. No to Urban Garden Supply. Go check them out. They are about four and a half blocks northeast of Coors Field in Denver, Colorado. You're listening to iCannabis Radio on Monday night. See you in a minute. Are you a medical marijuana patient or interested in finding out how to become one? Contact Mile High Wellness, where your care is our concern. Conveniently located on Hamden and Tamarack in the Whole Foods parking lot behind Proof of the Pudding, Mile High Wellness offers a wide variety of edibles, hashes, and some of Colorado's top strains. Mile High Wellness, where your care is our concern. 3525 South Tamarack Suite 110 on the corner of Hamden and Tamarack. 720-382-8516. Mile High Wellness, where your care is our concern. Welcome back. Welcome back. I'm Georgia. We're in the studio with Chris Stubbs from Can Labs. Hey, hey. I'm going to pull up your website. Your website's so helpful. It's a really That's great site. That's good to hear. Yeah. yeah, we retooled a bunch of it when I came on board because the info just wasn't there, and I and there was a lot of weird info still, and that happens everywhere. Right. I mean, I saw an article that was uh, posted last year, last, like, uh-huh. May or something like that, April or May, it seems like, and it got a... Another big kick in the uh, on the interwebs. On the winter webs. <laughs> yeah, and I read it again and saw the same mistakes in it. Oh wow! You know, and so this, these things happen, but non- nonetheless, we retooled it and did a bunch of uh, search engine optimization thanks to a couple of our business partners that have been with Jennifer f- longer than I have. Nice. Um, yeah, they've been really, really kicking it there. They're computer nerds. And so they helped out a lot with that. Steve Kiltz is on the uh, site there um, under our personnel. Yep. He's one of them. Shout out Steve. Um, so he helped out a lot, and then we just redesigned it, and we're posting data now. It's in a simplified form, but at least it's out there for people to kind of see what's going on. And it's canlabs.com, C-A-N-N-L-A-B-S.com. That's but Chris, it. let's back up just a little yeah. bit. Um, tell us a little bit about your background and then a little bit about what what can labs does what does testing mean and, and you know just kind of give us the basics definitely well i came out of uh, the university of colorado in the springs in colorado springs um dr bob melamede was the chair of the bio department back then and i met him in 2001 when i went to school and we became a little closer in 2002 i was looking for summer work and he's like just work in my lab nice like deal <laughs> and it was the biggest lab on the floor and um, I got my hands wet quick. Sure. And that was before any of my advanced courses. Um, I started as a biology pre-med, went and got accepted into the nursing school within the campus and did about a year and a half worth of work there and then switched back to, uh, so I had bio and nursing and then back to bio and chemistry under pre-med because they created a dual degree program. So I did all that. Did you have a social life? Was there anything uh, social? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I had wow. A lot of fun, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nice. Not as much as see your Boulder kids, but we had fun <laughs> for sure. And uh, yeah, so by the time I graduated, I had, you know, almost as many years of research experience and wow. learned, uh, started with cancer and cannabinoids studying receptor levels and drug sensitive and drug resistant cancer cells, what their metabolic strategies were, um, how the endocannabinoid receptors were regulated in that context. And that was really interesting. I bet. Um, And then my last couple of years got more into analytical chemistry. And I worked up here at the CU Health Sciences Center for about three years after school and made a switch from cannabinoids and cancer and metabolism to genetic engineering and drosophila. Oh, wow. Fruit flies. Wow. Building genes and mutating them and uh, doing all kinds of super nerdy stuff. <laughs> and then when that appointment was up, Dr. Bob called and said that they were starting, uh, you know, had done a number of things to create a business model for a publicly traded company yep. called Cannabis Science yep. and wanted me to come back to the university to work on some intellectual property that they shared with CU and then um, take the direction of Cannabis Science through the FDA, FDA route. And that kind of, for me, fizzled in the end for a number of different reasons. I won't go into, Bob and I are still close. Um, they're still working on a lot of funding. And so uh, I actually aim to get back out of the industry completely. Uh, for a while because it's very frustrating to have consulted with 
you know, every major lab in the state and yeah. seeing that, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I was part of uh, Genovations early on um, in the springs, and that was just after Full Spectrum and I had spoken. And, um, you know, I got involved with a lot of things really quick and, and did had an understanding of the application and the analytical chemistry really early on, but still had no way to implement it, you know. And uh, so now, <laughs> after a, uh, a brief um, sabbatical, I guess you'd call it, <laughs> for about eight months, I came back in with Cam Labs. Nice. They contacted me. Yeah, right before I was going to contact them. And be like, <laughs> Perfect. Guys, the thing? Because I had been looking around on the site and was like, they're, something's going on here. It's not quite right. And uh, so I knew they needed some analytical help. So I came in and here we are. And what's your role with them? I'm the laboratory di director. And so all decisions on data, on uh, the analytical work, calibrations, uh, what our standard operating procedures are, the methods we use, uh, everything from health and safety to our actual day-to-day -day is part of my control. Nice. Um, we have another gentleman in there, Tony Greco. He's our lab tech. He's been with Can Labs since, I think, last November, and he's, he's solid. He's some of the best hands I've seen in the lab in 10 years. Wow. Um, so to have him and the equipment that we have, which... You know, even with Full Spectrum, they were a big lab. They were really after a lot of data. Um, when they first started, they were charging a proper price for a test, but in the end, it was depressed down to 25 bucks, and now we're still fighting that. Sure. Um, but, you know, we give five quantitative numbers, which usually you pay a lab by the number. Mm -hmm. So we give five good numbers for uh, 80 bucks, and that's come a long way. I don't think we'd be able to do what we do in the space that we do it in with the people we have any other way. I mean, we've really had to trim down and make sure it's very efficient. And sure. I've tested every step in the process to make sure they work. And that's something that's really important with edibles you talked about earlier. Yeah. Like, um, and CBD, those are the two big things. Right. We have CBD, and then this doesn't. Yeah. And then they'll, either, <laughs> they'll say, okay, let's go find it, or you guys can't find it, you know, you guys have trouble analyzing this and that. And it's like, I just walked you through all these <laughs> steps and showed you data examples and, you know, data about our extraction efficiencies, for example. If we have somebody formulate with us, they come and test a base oil mm -hmm. and they dose a line of chocolate bars and bring one of those back in and we get the dose back. I don't have extraction efficiency problems. Does that make sense? Yes. Like I'm getting all the cannabinoids yes. out <clears throat> and we're able to show that in the data. So we've tested every step in the process, and I've, we're very close to validating the whole thing. Uh, there's a couple of barriers in our way there. Scientific validation is just a process of really nailing down what your day-to-day -day and interday variability is, your repeatability, and uh, all that stuff. So, so what's the process if, if, um, if someone wants to give you a sample to get tested, what needs to happen? And then once you get that, that product, what do you, what do you do with it? And and then how do you basically the yeah they're um you either have a red card or the proper dispensary licensure or uh, infused products manufacturing license and so people who are growing their own can get tested. yeah yeah and we have patient pricing is different from industry just because you know that's something we decided to sense. do it does make sense yes. and that's the case with a lot of other industry labs like that everything i do in the lab is based on the international standards um four labs that dictate everything from how you take samples in and document it to whether or not you pay before or after to, you know, the health and safety. Mm -hmm. And so everything's very um, tried and true. But nonetheless, a uh, person would come in, fill out an analytical services request form that says their sample type and as much information as they want to give about it because that helps us. What kind of information? Um, if it's an oil or a wax or what solvent it was done with or what strain it was or any weird things they had happen in the process. A lot of people come in with pointed questions sure. and uh, want some additional information of how they can improve their process. So they're thinking, um, I, I want to increase potency, potency or, and I did this and therefore yeah, I think it's going to work. We had okay. some folks in today, how do I get the chlorophyll out of here? You know, How do I clean this up further? Um, some people will try one method of cleanup 
for a longer period of time, and that doesn't work. As mm -hmm. a chemist, you always have to take multiple routes okay. to clean up, and that means filtering and a dual solvent extraction and a rotovap and this. You know what I mean? There's there's always uh, more steps than just one process. So we do consulting work too for people that have really complicated questions or need help formulating because of the math or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, but basically you drop off the sample, um, pay beforehand, and then we take it into the lab. And um, if it's flowers or concentrates, that's a pretty straightforward extraction. Okay. Um, we use all chromatographic grade solvents, which means uh, they're all designed for the high pressure liquid chromatograph for that okay. instrument. If they're less than 99% purity, we can't uh, work with them because you see too much noise. So every part of it's calibrated. The instrument is calibrated with known chemical reference standards, uh, which are 99% pure versions of the cannabinoids that have been certified by the DEA and the FDA and that chemical supply company itself. Wow. And then it gets to us and we calibrate the instrument with those known standards and follow government guidelines for that. And then the scale and pipettes are also calibrated by a third party company to make sure that when I transfer volume to the flower concentrate and heat it up, stir it around, vortex it, you know, and filter it, um, that all those transfers and weighs, um, the known weights we're getting are tried and true. Okay. And um, edibles get a little more complicated. I think drinks are my biggest challenge. Uh, we did some bath water this week, which nice. is interesting. People are like, we can't get out of the bath. We're so medicated <laughs> afterwards. And I'm like, how is this happening? From the bath salts? It, uh, it was a tea. A tea. But... You know, I ended up the number I got off. Bring the, it. <laughs> and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this example. You guys will laugh. But um, nonetheless, <clears throat> edibles and, uh, and drinks are really tough. And if you follow something you know that works, that's one thing. But if we get a salve in, yeah. for example, salves can be done with all kinds of different ingredients. And I have to optimize that extraction every time. Whereas with a chocolate bar, we know exactly what to do. Um, and, and, it, and it works every time so and we do full edible extraction. So the idea is someone wanted to test their base and then test their end product to make sure that they agree. Yep. And that goes a long way for your business. Yes. You know, you're not overdosing every time and wasting oil. You could make a hundred more edibles or, um, the patient actually knows what a tested dose means, right. which is huge. I don't think I need to stress that enough. I right. have every time I'm on the radio, like, yes. cause I've been in the corner of my house, like, <laughs> for, you know, 40 minutes, like, uh, waiting for it to go away. And it's, you know, st so anyway. And the other um, half was nothing. <laughs> oh, I ate the whole damn thing. Oh, see, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> it was a known dose. Known dose. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Exactly. Uh, Nonetheless, we do full edible extractions, and that's really important for sampling. Right. Um, and I don't think any other lab in the state's capable of doing what we do there, uh, period. They all have GCs or uh, uh, TLC, which is thin layer chromatography, the blotting test. And okay. those are, you know, they've got bigger error ranges, and you don't get a full extraction because they're sampling. So I think we've, we've done a really good job. I've got some data on people that have tested with us and got closer and closer and closer to their formulated labeled dose. Nice. And that's what you want. Right. Um, so, yeah, we do everything. There's not been – drinks, I think, are, are, like I said, the most dicey. But Why are they so challenging? Because you need really precise numbers on – this gets kind of complicated, but um, – Dumb it down, we, please. We <laughs> – uh, it has to do with the error range. Okay. I'm only, re I'm, re that's the bottom line. I'm only comfortable reporting within a certain range. And we either go back and recalibrate or stop everything if it's out of range. And with drinks, I can tell if the whole, de like, it's really the, the washing of the bottle. We'll pour the drink out and sample that all day, and I can get true numbers on that. But when I wash the bottle to see what's going on, I get wacky numbers okay. and there's, a, there's that's pretty complicated sure. but um we've done everything from little infusions you know alcoholic dropper infusions to olive oils hemp oil infusions all that and it it works out sometimes it takes me like 
10 or 15 runs on the instrument, you know, to get at different concentrations to make sure all the numbers agree. So, so when you report the results to, to your clients, they're emailed okay. in a standard and, format. And, what's, yeah. and what are the results that they're getting? What are the, what are the five numbers we that they're give, getting? We uh, give, it's THC acid and CBD acid, uh, CBD, CBN, and Delta 9. And those are reported in weight percentages on the smokables report. Mm -hmm. um, that's paired with a visual inspection for mold, fungus, and other contaminants. I've seen a lot over the years. But it's just a very basic, like, you guys got some mold, and it's a five. It's a subjective number. But you okay. can at least point it out. We'll take a picture of the oh. uh, flower or wax. Or I found caterpillars in bud, so... Like, I've seen it all. Like, full like bugs? Full-blown caterpillars <laughs> in the stem. Wow. Wow. Uh, wow. Yeah. <clears throat> How big of a caterpillar? <laughs> I'm talking, like, an inch and a half. Are you serious? Bright orange. You know, I've seen two of them in the same ounce, man. If that's your home grow, one, fabulous. If that's from a licensed a facility, grow. that's terrible. Um, and it's come a long way, I have to say. Wow. But, I mean, two <laughs> years ago, the stuff we saw come in to labs was just like, Look, oh, stuff's orange. <laughs> but <laughs> Why I've it got seen all those a legs? lot of stuff. But, yeah, that report's <clears throat> just like that, very straightforward. <laughs> and then the edible report has weight percentages and milligrams per gram. And also milligrams in the entire edible. So we normalize the data to a gram, and then we also extrapolate that out to if it's a 360-gram drink, then you'll know what it has in it versus the label. I had a quick question. Yeah, go the, for it. The drinks, yeah. um, is, it, is it hard to test because what's left over on the glass that's yeah getting <clears throat> so i've 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 there's some I've, interesting stuff that goes on there because it's there is some adherence and you have to i have to have a better scale basically is what it boils down to and so if anybody's got an extra five grand lying around right uh we'll get that scale on there and i can get a really good number but that is why okay yeah okay. it's it's about sampling and how you measure your differences and all of that. Because that's the one thing that I don't like drinks is what they... You know what? I tell you what. They've come a long way, and they're de every time um, I've tested uh, a couple of folks, Dixie's are, are always on. Um, Never Canna tried Punch is product. always on. Canna Punch? Those two okay. know what they're doing. Okay. They're the only two that's seen it through the lab. Okay. Um, the other ones I just can't speak about. I have no idea. No problem. And I don't no. usually endorse people or do anything like that, but I can, I can say for the patients out there, because I'm one too, that it works. And it's, it's labeled right. Because that's, that's awful. All that sugar in a drink mm -hmm. and, you know, not knowing what you're going to get. <laughs> and well, then yeah. they can like, you know, there's a 200 milligram drink on the market. Like, right. I'm sorry, you're going to be uncomfortable <laughs> if you don't know what you're doing. Right, absolutely. So, and that's scary. So I had a um, an infused products owner tell mm -hmm. me that they had their base tested and it came up zero. Hmm, with us? Um, I don't know if it was with you or not. I'm just curious how that happens and how that could happen. That's, I don't know. That's bad data. We don't usually release zeros unless it's really... Zero. I mean, how could it be a zero? How could I don't know. how could an activated base? What do you mean by base, though? Um, is it, it a base oil or mm -hmm. a base? Okay, so if this is a concentrate that should be hitting somewhere between forty and eighty percent, is what you're saying, and it came back zero. as a zero. Yeah, twice. Huh? Twice. That's interesting. I don't know. So that was an anomaly, mo yeah. more than likely. I mean, if it came out of our lab since March 25th, I'd I have, no have a problem with that. I'd have to go look it up because there's no way it was us. Yeah, I have no idea. I mean, we are error reporting. Every now we mess up a number or a label or something like that because we're running – we built some software to pull – uh, numbers off the instrument and put them in the report, which is really cool. Yeah, nice. Again, thanks to the shout out to the nerds. Like, yeah, like I'm like, we always do are doing this shout tonight. outs to the nerds. Shout out to the nerds. <laughs> that's great. I'll be up all night. <laughs> you know, um, so that's happened a couple of times. I've made mistakes, Tony. And we're all human. But right. the, the data itself, um, we've made very few errors, especially like that. But it happens. And we have well, clients have that come in and say, hey, I think something's up. And sure enough, we'll go back and look into it and do the extraction a little differently or sample it multiple times, whatever it is. Tinctures and infusions have the biggest like sampling errors. Yeah. Um, and so sometimes that'll happen. And we go back and look at it and test it again. And 
if we're right, we're right. If we're not, we're not. And yeah. we give them the test on that one. So um, Chris, Chris mentioned something um, in our intro today about um, how he wishes that more centers would have their product tested. Mm-hmm. And he and his <clears throat> comment was, but they are afraid. Yeah, my, I've asked some just from going in. And yeah. their, their rebuttal would be like, yeah, we're afraid that something's going to happen or we're going to get, get a, a bad we're result. We're going to get something from, well, not not necessarily a bad result. What it, what it felt to me like they were saying is that the government is going to find something out that that they don't want. I, I don't know. It, <laughs> I it was, see. Really? Because they weird. sell marijuana for a living. That, yeah, that's what I was, that's <laughs> what I was thinking. The government I'm like, knows. I don't, I don't know. They already just do. A, a bullshit answer. There's a lot of bullshit out there, and uh, frankly, a lot of people just don't care. But I, don't you I think mean, the fear is? Don't you think the fear is that they, um, as soon as they have a hard number, mm-hmm. they have to do one of two things: either hide it because the number's low, or sing it from the rooftops well, I mean, and then hope that that's always the number. You know, you got, everybody's got to understand that there's there's a lot going on here with the numbers, and I've seen a lot of data, like a lot of data. I think Bob Winicky, for, you know, mm-hmm, from mm-hmm. Uh, Full Spectrum is the only other person that's seen as much data as I have right. on this particular thing. Uh, in this state and, you know, outside of that, you got the Dutch and they are, are killing it with data. But nonetheless, with flowers, like your Delta 9 number, which is derived from THC acid and HPLC. What that means is we're measuring the acidic cannabinoids themselves. And when you light them and smoke them or vaporize them, uh, those are converted into neutral forms. And there's a small uh, 13%-ish loss um, on that percentage. And so we do those conversions on the numbers. So you see what it is in the plant, what it is if you'd smoke it, et cetera. But, you know, the old Boulder blueberry that I got, you know, pre-Amendment 20, uh, statute of limitations. Right, right. <laughs> when I got it, uh, you know, when I was hanging out. <laughs> um, you know, it smells like American blueberry pie. And it <laughs> is thick and dense and amazing. And I know a guy that still has that strain. Uh, they just got it again. And it has never tested above 14%, 15%. Like, that's it. But I'd prefer that over a 30 percenter that he grows every day because it's like, right, and it doesn't right. smell as good. It's different. And the Hemp Connoisseur Championship that just went down, that was, I told Dave, you know, if, if this is done right, you're going to see the place breaks at like a hundredth of a percent. And that's what happened. You know, like the difference between first and second or second and third or some of these were just negligible yeah They're tiny yeah. numbers um but nonetheless with flowers you know the patients and connoisseurs choice did not line up with our testing yeah the highest really. testing stuff people didn't like as much and you know and i'm so, so glad you say if that if you get upset about you know like how your blueberry tests because it's low that doesn't mean much at all if your patient's get what they need out of it. That's all that matters. Absolutely. And if you get some extra information about how your grower's doing and how you could use it as an extraction, or if you're under 70, 30 and you're getting rid of wholesale, you can show them that it's actually got this in it. Yeah. You know, and some organizations run concentrates and flowers that way. Like if they're above this tier, then they're a little bit more right, that per gram. More. So yeah. there's a lot to that. But I think with edibles, it really matters with potency. With concentrates and flowers, I think it's kind of a different story. You get some info on the minor cannabinoids, which is very helpful. Um, but other, otherwise, with all the different BMIs in the world coming into your shop and all the different right. ranges of potency and that cross mix and what's physiologically available realistically, like some of it is a wash. I, yeah, and absolutely. And so don't get discouraged. Come in and find out what you've got, you know, and it, it puts you up against the other people that are testing. Absolutely. Yeah. And and that's a that's a great note to end on. I think that's really important um, that that numbers are numbers. And, yeah. um, and how you look, I mean, statistics in general, I mean, you can look at them all kinds of different ways, but these particular numbers. Um, that's I, how you get better. They can mean a <laughs> lot a, depending on how you take them. And they, they might just mean that you're being responsible. Well, yeah. I and, mean, and either way is a win-win for if the you have patient, a patient and the business. That's you know? right. If you have a patient that loves this blueberry every single time, mm-hmm. um, you know, you want to know why, why is it that they love it? Because if you turn around and give them something that's testing at 30, um, right. you know, they, it's going to be too much. It's going to be too much. They're not going to like it. Yeah. Um, we're going to take a quick break cause we actually are running over cause Chris has been talking. Sorry, everybody. 
<laughs> it's Hope been it was wonderful. good info, though. It's wonderful. Don't go anywhere. We're not okay. quite done. Um, hey, have you guys been up to medical marijuana of the Rockies lately? Hello, hello. Didn't you just go up to the mountains this weekend? No, I wasn't there. I was at the... I could have sworn you said no. you were going to go up and see our friends Aaron no, and I'm Jerry. Actually, I'm actually thinking about going up this weekend, uh, staying up in Glenwood. So if I do, I will stop by there. In Frisco, exit yes. 203 yes. off of I-70. Mm-hmm. Medical Marijuana of the Rockies is your mountain source for meds. They have a fantastic strain selection and their immature plants or clones, as we like to call them unofficially. Um, selection is available on their website so you know what you can get before you head up there. Um, as I said, they're located at exit 203 off of I-70 and right behind the Big O Tires up in Frisco. These folks are just fantastic people, and you got to hurry up because once ski season starts, um, there's a line out the door, and so you definitely want to hit them when it's a little bit of a slower season so that when you go during ski season, they know your name, and uh, um, I think they might even push you to the front of the line if you tell them that you heard about them on iCannabis Radio. That's Medical Marijuana of the Rockies, mmrockies.com. Make sure that you tell Jerry and Aaron that you heard about them on iCannabis Radio. We'll be right back trouble with the law, or maybe you're looking to start a medical marijuana business, the law firm of Edson, Maiton, and Matz can help. Attorneys Warren Edson, Lauren Maiton, and Chris Matz offer a wide range of criminal defense related assistance and cannabis business legal services. Call the team of legal professionals ready to help you or your business out today. 303-831-8188. That's 303-831-8188. Or check out the website, warrenedson.com. That's warrenedson, E-D-S-O-N.com. You're listening to Georgia Edson on iCannabisRadio.com. We were talking about blueberry and everyone's getting all excited. Um, so, so what do people need to do, um, whether they are um, home growing or whether they are a licensed facility, what they need to do to get in touch with you guys and get some testing done? Website's the best. Uh, you can call for an appointment. Um, I do lab tours in the afternoons. Oh, fun. Yeah, so that's one thing. If you're skeptical, you don't know what to think, uh, you don't know who I am or what the hell I do, come see us. Uh, you know that's something do. that we really do, and we're going to put a v- virtual tour on the site to kind of help that process. But I think a lot of people are still skeptical of testing, which, you know, I am too. And when I worked for a couple other organizations, I tested with everybody just to see. But we did it that way or no way. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was like you had to do all of it. So I think um, the best way is to get in touch with us, come in and see the lab, uh, get acquainted with the process. It's really not hard. Um, Excellent. Yeah. And so the website is a great w- resource. That's Can Labs, um, C-A-N-N-L-A-B-S, two N's. A B and an S dot yep. com. And we've got a blog uh, linked on there too, where I link uh, scientific publications and translate them into somewhat English. less jargon. And yeah, yeah nice. hopefully. Nice. Um, and there's some patient experiences on there too, here and there. Cause you know, we, I see very often a publication that mimics something in, in human health that we've seen here, been lucky enough to see here and even provide a formulated, you know, product with and that's that's what the whole key is it brings it full circle that's why i do what i do well thank you so much for joining us today feel free to sit and hang out um but you guys definitely visit um chris at can labs and also um chris and jennifer do a spot with um, american weed realm radio on tuesday nights as well so we can have back-to-back can lab nights yeah totally i think jennifer might be doing a show soon uh, that's what we're thinking. That's the rumor. Yeah. That would be awesome. It'd be so it'd be great to have a yeah, side show. Yeah, that'd be cool. Jennifer's awesome. Yes, she is. <laughs> so on a she slightly has, different she, note, sorry. She has Diesel's girlfriend. Um, <laughs> Gigi, yeah. <laughs> Can they have babies, or are they both done with? Like, he has no. Ah. Uh, well, he has a. He just has not the little dangly ones, you know. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. Enough, anyway. <laughs> so we promised that we would um, dispel or confirm some rumors today. Oh, fun! Yeah, the I big can hang around for a little bit. Yeah, maybe I don't know. <laughs> so I might plead the fifth a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. This is awesome. So this morning on Celeb Stoner, our friend Steve Bloom. Um, who we've had on the show a whole bunch of times. We haven't had him on the show recently, and, and I ought to do that. 
Um, he broke a story entitled "Normal Conference Ends on a da- on Down Note." Normal being the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, um, and he stated that uh, that Executive Director Alan Saint Pierre was asked to resign by the Board of Directors of Normal after their national conference this weekend in Los Angeles. Dunana, as you guys <laughs> probably remember, um, about a year ago now. Um, uh, the there was a big split between um, this radio station um, and Normal when when it was um, Alan in a in a what he considered a private forum um, a listserv of more than six hundred attorneys talked um, openly about his disdain for medical marijuana and that the industry is a sham and that the people who are in the industry are profiteers. Um, he was very angry because he thought that he was speaking privately. I don't know how you think that speaking to 600 people is a private. private, and when you put anything in writing and sent it over the internet, that that's private. Um, if you can look at Mitt Romney's private fundraising dinner um, that was videotaped and has now um, been on every single um, pro-Obama ad period, where Romney talks pretty clearly about... Um, stating something to the effect of, I don't give a shit about 47% of the population of the United States. Um, Alan St. Pierre says essentially the same thing. Um, and it's and it's been pretty awful. Um, he, um, I mean, they, as, as you guys have heard before, they personally attacked um, me and my family, um, said that um, Warren and I want to see... Um, um, recreational marijuana users um, go to prison and lose their children, which I find ironic since I'm on the cover of the West Coast Leaf <laughs> this month um, for my activism for um, Pro Amendment 64. Um, so fuck you. Um, but <laughs> but I will say that when the celeb stoner story broke, um, <laughs> it wasn't confirmed, and I went ahead and emailed the president of the board of of normal. And the response that I got was that, um, no, indeed, that that hasn't exactly happened. Um, and what I actually got was, a was, a um, what's probably become, um, the, the pat answer that everyone's giving at normal. And it reads something like this. Let's see, quote, unquote, there has been no change in the employment status of any member of the normal, of the normal staff. If such change were to occur, as with any important development, the board would issue an appropriate, appropriate statement. That quote was also the quote that Paula Armentano, who's the deputy director of Normal, um, gave as well. Mm. Um, that's the quote that that um, Paul Kuhn, the board president, gave <coughs> to um, Steve Bloom of Celeb Stoner as well. So um, it, they also go on to say that, um, according to board member uh, Dale Geringer, uh, who was at the conference, quote unquote, Alan St. Pierre has not been fired as of yet. Rather, the normal board will be considering a motion to search for a new executive director uh, at the next board meeting, hmm. uh, which is November 28th, uh, until the board approves that motion, Alan will remain executive director unless he chooses to resign. Uh, the motion is sponsored by the board's executive committee in response to a litany of complaints about St. Pierre's performance. I'm sorry, yeah, performance which have accumulated over the past years of his tenure. Um, Alan has been with Normal for 22 years, has mm-hmm. been the executive director since 2005. Um, I mean, I've known him for a gajillion years. Um, as a human being, I think that he's a kind, gentle, intelligent human being. Um, as a marijuana activist, I think he's lost touch with um, what's important to um, to end prohibition. Um and I'm sorry to say that. So, but just wanted to confirm that that while um, while that wa- that news broke today, it is not true. Hmm. More will be revealed at on November 28th when the board meets um, in their annual legal conference in Key West, Florida. So that's the juicy stuff. <laughs> in Key West. I know. I know. It's we, supposedly very fun. It's really fun. It's We've done really the normal legal seminar in Aspen. That's pretty fun and too. That's the- Best thing ever. Yeah, the Key West. I one really is like that. But yeah. my my days of going to these normal things are are long since over. But anyhow, uh-huh. that's that's uh, you don't you don't really come back from that. You don't really come back from as as far as uh, 
as Alan's concerned, you don't come back from alienating, um, you know, 17 states and and potentially three more um, yeah. by, by saying that this That's is tough. a sham. I mean, here we are. It was so fascinating to me. Oh, and he also said that um, out of every 10 uh, medical patients, only one uses it legitimately. Yeah, and that's you know, no one has a has a history of getting caught saying strange things in regard to medical cannabis and period, in conversations that were supposed to be held privately, quote unquote, or whatever. And I mean, the reality is they create a lot, a lot of awareness. And uh, local for those chapters of us, are fantastic. Yeah, I will support for those of local chapters. Yeah, for always, of mm-hmm. course. And I think that's really important. Um, but it's it is easy to lose touch sometimes for people, and there's miscommunications that happen in this industry well, you all know, the but time, when you, and when I you hate in- that too. You know, you never know sometimes, but it's your actions that speak. Well, and that's know, why and that's why you have to be really careful about what you say and the research that you do before you yeah, say it. Yeah. But you know what happens, and this is this isn't unusual. People insulate themselves with with like thinkers, mm-hmm. and so and so you don't necessarily get a feel for. Um, for what what sort of public opinion is because you're so uh, you're surrounded, surrounded by the people who are saying, yes, what you're saying is true. And, and I think that that's happened to Alan St. Pierre and, and Keith Strop as well, that, that they aren't listening mm-hmm. to the fact that, um, that legalizing marijuana for medical purposes has been the most beneficial thing to happen um, to anti-prohibitionists, um, oh, yeah. ever, ever in in the past seventy years for sure, and and you know they can take some credit for that um, if they want to. That's fine, but but they can also um, they should also take the heat for for polarizing the community this past year in particular. Um, you know they're really upset that their board of directors isn't completely on board with the support of Washington's. Um, um, initiative 502, mm-hmm. um, which ostensibly says if you are a um, marijuana smoker, um, you have to choose between using marijuana and driving your car. I mean, that's what you, you, that's that's the case. You get pulled over, um, and there is no proving your impairment. You get pulled over. They do a blood test. You test five nanograms or above, and you've gotten yourself a DUID. It's the worst limit. Ever. It, it's, it makes no sense. There's no science behind it. Um, there is, and it's all to the contrary, saying that it's a ridiculous damn limit. And yet that cough is probably on Valium. Right? And, you know, and, like prescription drug testing doesn't exist. Well, and rather, like in that. my mind, rather than, rather than saying um, – Hey, let's let's spend our time, effort, and money educating people on the fact that there's already DUID laws, mm-hmm. and it already is a law that says if you show impairments mm-hmm. and then you yeah. test positive, you are going to be charged with with a DUID. Yeah. Rather than just saying, you know what, we are going to pander to. It's to unrealistic. Remember, yeah. there, there was an article about um, Allison Holcomb, who is um, who was the primary author of, of 502, considers herself a soccer mom, which is really funny because she has a. F- four-year-old and and maybe her four-year-old plays soccer but nonetheless she's trying to she's trying to connect with that demographic which I am that demographic and I do have a f- son who a plays soccer I, yeah. I, have, I have a seven-year-old and she kicks and, stuff but not very well right <laughs> right so so my kid plays soccer I get it I'm that demographic um and you know what I'm really intelligent and so if you tell me gosh here's what's going to happen we are going to we are going to demand that someone gets a DUID um if they test at this kind of random limit, or we're going to put in place, uh, we're going to make sure that you understand the laws that are already in place that are already set forth. I'm going to say, wow, I'm a really smart person. I can figure out what makes more more sense. Why would we? Why would we compile needless laws mm-hmm. when we've already got the ones that make sense? And why would we compile laws that are essentially going to punish people for not doing anything That's harmful? It's going to punish the state too if those people can't pay their fees or go to the DMV or do any of that. They just don't interact with the system anymore. Well, maybe they'll be able to keep the prisons fuller. I think that's maybe what and, it is. And, and, <laughs> and, and that very well could be. And, and you know, I mean, public defenders and all these things cost yeah. the state a significant ton amount of money. of money. We're wasting um, tons of money. So it's American. I just think, I mean, maybe maybe if they listened to this show, um, they yeah. would be a little bit more in touch with what a real soccer mom thinks. And, and you know, I don't wear that as a badge of honor. It's just the demographic that I fit into. I'm a middle-aged woman with a soccer-playing son. Boom. Um, 
Who Bam. happens to also live be in a state that has data about impaired driving and right. real patients. You know, th- that's the other thing is there is data out there. And if you look on the inebriated level of your plasma, like the five nanogram level is on the and sh- you know the, the the shoulders of the bell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Before yeah. you got medicated and way after. So everything in the middle is where the law is not constructed around. It's very counterintuitive, and we'll continue to see counterintuitive measures like that that are not based in reality because somebody's had a boo boo. Well, in it's, the past. it's pandering. It's pandering mm-hmm. in the hopes to get a law passed. And and I guess if you believe in the philosophy that something is better than nothing, um, then then fantastic. I'm not sure I believe in that. I'm but the not something's sure. already there, so the nothing would have let the something stay right. like you said. Well, you and know? the other something, the other <laughs> something confusing is confusing let's have that. a law. Let's 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 um, you know let's end prohibition in Washington. So there's a something because um, right now they have they have medical, which I guess normal is saying is the nothing, um, or yeah. at least I'm assuming that that's what they're saying in my opinion. Um, but but I don't believe in this that that you have to give up a portion of what's important in order to get a law passed. I mean, I think again, if if people would have been educated on um, mm-hmm. on all of the, the components, agree. you know, we had Steve Elliott on a couple of weeks ago, and his one of his biggest um, deals is that it doesn't allow for um, for home growing, and for him, that's a deal breaker. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that that's fine. He's he's welcome to that opinion. I I personally that's not a deal breaker for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there's lots of people who who dabble in growing, and that's that's very fun for them. Um, but there's a lot of people. I mean, if my something or nothing. I mean, how about going into a store, showing that you're of age and purchasing? That's incredible. That's pretty incredible. And it's it's a privilege, you know. But not to lose your ability to drive your car. Yeah. I mean, that just seems devastating. Well, guns. Guns, concealed. You don't want to get me started on all this. I know, but right? Gun, no, just having a gun. Oh, have, yeah, having and a gun. and having uh-huh. your license. Yeah, like both of those are constitutionally protected American things in this state. Yeah, and yet I still can't go buy a gun. I thought you couldn't have a concealed handgun permit. I thought I, that's what it was. No, I mean the whole thing is, I mean, at, at the federal level. Right. With parks and stuff like that. I mean, that's still there. You get no, you're screwed. If you have guns in the car in a national park, that's one thing. If they find pot. Right. Right. Oh, oh, right. Exactly right. You know, there's no excuse. Here's my red card. Like, we don't care. Right. You know, so there's still, we have a long way to go, but we do have something. You we know, do have a long way to go. And, too and bad. Let, let's We're going to see the driving bill five nanogram limit here again. again no, we will. In a, no, in a couple we will. months. And it's no, you're absolutely three right. Times, you know? You're absolutely right. And, and let's not sell ourselves shorts. We are not second class citizens because we believe that prohibition is wrong. Mm-mm. Okay, my rant is over. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let me talk a little bit about what's going on this week. Um, American Weed, Realm Radio tomorrow from 6.30 to 8 p.m. And then Sex Pot Radio after that from 8 to 10. Jenny's got some exciting stuff going on. Um, girls in costumes is all I'm going to say. And me. You're going to be in a costume? <laughs> uh, yeah, I told her she get two. I told her if she got two girls on here that I'd let her dress me up. That'd be part. I might, I might have to it. come down. I might <laughs> have to come fun. down. I think I'll be Just here as long as it's not too revealing. <laughs> right. We don't want your boobs showing on <laughs> Sex Pot Radio. You're going to be a sexy little bumblebee, <laughs> aren't you? <laughs> right. <laughs> They're going to have put him in a tight little thing. All right. I'm not that, coming that'll down. That'll be awesome. I'll be here. <laughs> um, I dab radio from 7 to 9 on Wednesday. Thursday in the afternoon, the Hemp Connoisseurs show from 4 to 5. I love having a drive time show. After that, we're going to have our special um, Hemp Connoisseur Championship results show from 5 to 6. And then from 7 to 9, Overgrow the Radio. Next week on um, Start the Week on iCannabis on Monday, we are going to have It's Time for Our History Lesson with Greg Dower. I look forward to that segment so much, don't you? Yes, I do. I like Greg Dower. He's it's, cool. It's really wonderful. Um, thank our sponsors, Mile High Wellness, Noto Urban Garden Supply, Edson Maiden and Mats, Medical Marijuana the Rockies, Medical Marijuana 101, Run on Grass. And thank you, Chris Stubbs from Can Labs for being here this week. You're very welcome. All right, good night, people.